Hi there. I'd like to welcome you back to our study of the book of Philippians. My name is Eric O'Neill, and I'm the pastor to children and youth here at Broken Arrow Nazarene Church. I'm excited to lead us through the next few verses of the book of Philippians. As a bit of a recap, the book of Philippians is a letter written by Paul the Apostle to the church in Philippi. And what we know of the origin story of the Philippian church is recorded in the book of Acts in chapter 16. We learn from this account that in response to a vision of a man from Macedonia, Paul, Silas, and Timothy set sail from Asia on Paul's second missionary journey. Landing in Neapolis, they made their way to the Roman colony of Philippi. Upon reaching Philippi, Paul's party encounters a group of women praying outside the city gate. One of them, a wealthy businesswoman named Lydia, becomes the first Christian convert and provides hospitality for the newborn church. During Paul's stay in Philippi, he and Silas were publicly beaten and put in jail after casting out a demon from a slave girl. This ultimately serves to further Paul's mission as he and Silas are able to minister to their jailer, resulting in the conversion and baptism of the jailer and his whole household. After being released from jail, Paul departed, leaving behind a small community of believers, which formed the Philippian church. Paul maintained contact with his young church while in prison in Rome through writing letters and, following his release, visited once again in person during his third missionary journey. As we learn from this letter, the Philippian church holds a special place in Paul's heart. Both Paul and the Philippians demonstrate a warm regard for one another and dedicated partnership in ministry. We see evidence of this close-knit relationship in the opening section of Paul's letter as we hear about this gift of money that the Philippian church sent with one of their members, Epaphroditus, to deliver to Paul. When Epaphroditus returned home from his visit, he returned with this letter from Paul. This letter, as we have seen over the past few weeks, is rich with hope, love, and encouragement for the Philippians. Paul takes every opportunity to build up this community for the work of the gospel, offering prayer, thanksgiving, words of support, and instruction. Now, unlike the other churches that Paul writes to in the New Testament, Paul doesn't write to the Philippians to point out issues taking place within the church, but to address challenging circumstances they find themselves in. To this end, Paul demonstrates solidarity with the Philippians by sharing in the same suffering. Or as Paul puts it at the end of chapter 1, you're involved in the same kind of struggle you saw me go through. As we move forward in our study of Philippians, our discussion is divided into two sections. Paul's message to the Philippians and the book of Philippians' message to us. We'll begin by looking at the content of Paul's message. What is being talked about? What situations and circumstances is Paul describing to the Philippians? Following that, we'll take a minute to look at the intention of Paul's message. How does Paul desire for the Philippians to respond? What instruction is being shared or modeled by Paul? Next, we'll turn to the Philippians' message to us to explore some ways the content of these verses speak to us today. What situations and circumstances do these verses describe in the world around us? And finally, we'll close by discussing the intention of Philippians' message for us describing how we might respond faithfully to this message. How does receiving the message of the book of Philippians equip us to respond with wisdom and grace to the circumstances we find ourselves facing? So, without further delay, let's turn to Philippians chapter 1, verses 15 through 18. Paul says to the Philippians, Some proclaim Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. These proclaim Christ out of love, knowing that I have been put here for the defense of the gospel. The others proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but intending to increase my suffering in my imprisonment. What does it matter? Just this, that Christ is proclaimed in every way, whether out of false motives or true, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. Earlier in this chapter, in verse 12, Paul shared with the Philippians an irony or blessing in disguise regarding his circumstances. He says, I want you to know, beloved, that what has happened to me has actually helped to spread the gospel. Paul goes on to describe how his imprisonment, though intended to hinder his mission, offered an opportunity for the gospel to be spread to the whole imperial guard. And starting in verse 15, Paul shares another example of irony another blessing in disguise. 
Paul tells us that after he was put in prison, there were others who proclaimed Christ. Across the board, the content of their message was the same, but the intent, the motivation for spreading the gospel, divides these people into two groups, those with good motives and those with false motives. Paul identifies these two groups through a series of contrasting statements. Those with good motives proclaim Christ from goodwill, out of love, knowing that Paul is here for the defense of the gospel and in truth. Those with false motives proclaim Christ because of envy and rivalry, out of selfish ambition, lacking sincerity, supposing that they can stir up trouble for Paul while he is in prison and in pretense. The group Paul describes with good motives is easy enough to identify. These are the authentic followers of Christ and fellow members of the church in Rome. But who would proclaim Christ with false motives? Who are Paul's rivals? The first group to be considered is a group of Jewish Christians called the Judaizers. In Paul's letter to the Galatians, we learn about a group of Jewish Christians who opposed Paul and sought to have influence over the Galatian church. Could these Roman rivals be Judaizers? Probably not. Uh, Paul's primary argument against the Judaizers in the book of Galatians is that they promote a false gospel by demanding that Christians strictly follow the Jewish law. And Paul's not shy in the least in condemning their message as incompatible with the message of Christ. And in contrast, Paul's rivals in Rome preach Christ. Taking what we know from Paul's life and what we hear from this passage, Paul's rivals were most likely fellow Roman preachers, taking advantage of an opportunity to bolster their reputation and influence in the church. It may be helpful to imagine that Paul was in many ways to the early church what Martin Luther King Jr. was to the civil rights movement. He was dedicated to a mission, well known by his contemporaries and held significant influence in the church and community. Having a key leader of a movement jailed, the weight of the mission falls on other leaders. And with Paul out of the game for a while, Paul's influence and status in the church and in the community was up for grabs. What does Paul think about all this? What does it matter? Just this, that Christ is proclaimed in every way, whether out of false motives or true. And in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. In Paul's contrasting statements of those with good motives and those with false, he shares one of the assumptions of his rivals. He says, The others proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but intending to increase my suffering in my imprisonment. Paul's rivals assume that it would bother him to get less attention, for the spotlight to turn away from him. They assume, in a sense, that Paul is motivated to preach Christ by the same things they are selfish ambition, envy, and rivalry. Paul's response to the situation serves as a model for the Philippians. Paul is neither concerned with the competition of these other preachers or the false reputation they hold of Paul. Paul rises above the pettiness. In a statement that only comes from proper perspective, Paul says, what does it matter? As long as Christ is being proclaimed, the less than pure motivations of these other preachers can be overlooked. Now, their behavior is by no means encouraged. As we'll see, Paul returns later on to the model of the rightly motivated preachers as an example worth following. But not all battles are worth fighting. Paul doesn't call his followers to stand up in his defense to confront these individuals or publicly call them out for having false motives. Instead, Paul models a response of humility, a willingness to see himself as less important and a response of wisdom, the ability to discern what is most important, that Christ is proclaimed in every way. As we turn to Philippians' message to us, we're looking at where the heart of Paul's message to the Philippians provides insight on the circumstances we face today. How do we experience the situation Paul was writing about? The question of motivation is one we face both inside and outside the church. Why do people do what they do? Is my waiter being nice to me out of the goodness of his heart, or so I'll leave a good tip? Are the kids obeying me just to avoid being punished? Are they asking me how my day is going because they care about me, or because they're just trying to be polite?
When stakes are low, motivation rarely comes to mind. I've never been concerned with the true motivation of my librarian. But when my parents end up in the hospital, I want a doctor who is motivated by more than a paycheck. Especially when people are working toward a common good, the question of motivation becomes even more significant. When the stakes are high, we have a very low tolerance for impure motives, whether it be from those in healthcare, law enforcement, politics, the court system, education, or the church. Why does he want to work with kids? Is she singing that solo just for the attention right now? Does he want the church to grow so he will look good? Are their motives pure? The answers to these questions are significant to us, and for that reason, having your own motives questioned is significant as well. How does this passage call us to respond? First, we're called to have pure motives, to model our lives around the example of those who proclaim Christ with good motives, that we would be people of sincerity, acting in truth, and in response to love and goodwill. The second faithful response to this passage involves practicing the humility and wisdom modeled by Paul. Practice humility. Find perspective by regarding yourself as less important than others. And in doing so, you will be set free from the need to serve your self-interest. And practice wisdom. When we are unfairly accused and our motives are questioned, our natural inclination is to defend our rights. We feel the need deep inside us to expose those who oppose us. But Paul's example points us in a different direction altogether. For those in the church with less than pure intentions, we should be reminded that God sometimes uses even faulty and insincere proclamation of the gospel for his saving purposes. Not all battles are worth fighting. Even those that might call your reputation into question in your pursuit of Christ. For the sake of the gospel, allow your reputation to be up for grabs. Allow yourself to be misunderstood, and in doing so, find yourself in good company with our apostle, who says to us, am I now seeking human approval or God's approval? Am I trying to please people? If I were still pleasing people, I would not be a servant of Christ. As you respond faithfully, May God equip you with wisdom, humility, and perspective by His Spirit. And may the same God who began a good work in you see it through to completion.